Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza denounced the crimes of the United States against his country before the International Criminal Court. The first death from coronavirus has been reported in Japan, while in China the death toll has risen to 1,367. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa delivered his 2020 State of the Nation address before a joint sitting of the two houses of parliament amid intense protests. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm Cristina Escobar. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza traveled to The Hague to denounce before the International Criminal Court the crimes of the United States against the Venezuelan population. We have come to this higher court to be able to confront an aggression which has manifested in multiple forms an aggression against the Venezuelan people. We know that many peoples will be interested in accompanying this legal action which we have begun. We have put our heart into this. That's why we said the prosecutor and we insist that he apply international law. We need to apply reason. That's why I expect to see this through in the shortest period of time in order to give an effective response with legal and moral and institutional authority to those responsible for these crimes against humanity, against the Bolivarian people of Venezuela. And our correspondent Sergio Rodrigo brings us more details in the following report. As you mentioned, Venezuela has presented a lawsuit against the United States before the International Criminal Court in The Hague for crimes against humanity. The Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza presented before the court this lawsuit for crimes against humanity, provoked by the coercive and unilateral measures imposed by the United States since 2014 against Venezuela. These measures have had direct effects against the Venezuelan people especially regarding health, education and food, and even migration. That is why Venezuelan foreign minister has presented this international lawsuit here in The Hague. As you mentioned, Venezuela has presented a lawsuit against the United States before the International Criminal Court in The Hague for crimes against humanity. The Venezuelan foreign minister Jorge Arreaza presented before the court this lawsuit for crimes against humanity, provoked by the coercive and unilateral measures imposed by the United States since 2014 against Venezuela. These measures have had direct effects against the Venezuelan people especially regarding health, education and food, and even migration. That is why Venezuelan foreign minister has presented this international lawsuit here in The Hague. The latest U.S. sanctions against Venezuela and acts of sabotage against public services have the country on high alert. The domestic right and its U.S. allies continue to work to destabilize the country. Last Friday, a new set of unilateral sanctions was imposed by the Trump administration, this time on the Venezuelan airline Combiasa. A day later, there was a bomb attack on the state telephone company CanTV and MobileNet. And on Monday morning, an act of sabotage was carried out against the Caracas Metro. All of these events could be considered as isolated incidents, but they coincided with Juan Guaido's tour through Europe and the United States, where he got more resources and backing for more sanctions against Venezuela. Every day, plans to sabotage the Caracas metro become more distant. It's a plan of these people who travel internationally to gather and find this group of vandals, saboteurs, and fascists. But we, with our organized people, are going to defeat them. Sectors of the opposition that have distanced themselves from Juan Guaido's leadership reject the sanctions and denounce it as U.S. interference. They have decided to rely on dialogue through the National Assembly, which is no longer led by Guaido, but another faction of the opposition. We have opposed Guaido because he has been a great promoter of hate, of disqualification. While Guaido threatened to burn us, to turn us into ashes, we tell Guaido to keep on fighting, but always through the democratic means. People are tired of the lies, the scams, the schemes, the fights. So we invite him to rejoin the Assembly as deputy for the state of Vargas. We invite him to start exercising his duties and move away from extremism, which makes the whole country suffer.
y a que obviamente se aleje. Many lawmakers are increasingly alarmed by the ever-mounting threats Guaido makes alongside U.S. President Donald Trump. I don't rule out any kind of possibility, even that they push him for further attacks against Venezuela. The United States' agenda is to disturb the democratic life of the country, impede the electoral process by the National Assembly, and I believe that their plan is to see how the process will become murky as a result of their actions. Even though Venezuela is preparing for parliamentary elections, lawmakers still haven't managed to appoint a new electoral council because of the fragmented opposition and their ongoing differences. The president of the National Constituent Assembly of Venezuela, Diosdado Cabello, speaking on his weekly televised show, offered details of the detention of Juan José Márquez, uncle of opposition lawmaker Juan Guaidó, on his arrival in Venezuela on Tuesday. Cabello indicated that Márquez was stopped for transporting explosive material on a commercial flight. Traía he was carrying tactical flashlights, which contain explosive chemical substances, presumably C4 synthetic explosive. Here they are, it's no lie. That was what this man was carrying. What else did he bring with him? An Israeli manual that specifies its culture and religious belief, the accreditation of Juan Guaidó's committee in the Republic to visit Canada and he brought refillable perfume capsules which contain explosive chemical substances, presumably C4. A further group of 250 Venezuelans living in Peru was repatriated as part of the return to the homeland plan. The group was flown back to Venezuela by a state-owned airline Conviasa, defying recent EU sanctions. This is the second group repatriated from Peru this year. The return to the homeland plan was launched by President Nicolás Maduro in 2018 to facilitate the return of Venezuelans living abroad after widespread reports of mistreatment, xenophobia and labor abuses. I don't have a job. That's the reason we went back. It's also for evaluating the quality of life. The quality of life for the Venezuelan means much more than being working to it. The Venezuelan is accustomed to education, mainly education, have quality of life, and here not found that quality of life. Coming up after this break, 44 social leaders have been assassinated so far this year in Colombia. Don't go away. Welcome back. The systematic assassination of social leaders in Colombia continues. The bodies of two social leaders who belong to the Community Action Board in the town of Fatima, Putumayo Department, were recently discovered. The victims were identified as Alberto Parra Lozada and his son, Yader Alberto Parra. There have been a total of 44 assassinations of social leaders in Colombia so far this year. And we stay on topic because relatives of Colombia's so-called false positive victims have staged a protest in front of the main court of the Special Jurisdiction for Peace. The group of protesters demanded that retired Army General Mario Montoya, who appeared before the court, assume his responsibility for the false positive killings that took place under his command. About 5,000 civilians known as false positives were killed by Colombian soldiers between 1988 and 2014 and later presented as guerrillas. General Mario Montoya, former commander of the Colombian National Army, offered his testimony regarding the false positive killings. He declared at a trial that involved 41 victims and 15 legal representatives. So far, Montoya has been mentioned in 11 testimonies by lower ranking military personnel. 
Today marks the 13th day of indefinite strike action by 20,000 oil workers in Brazil, protesting mass layoffs and the Bolsonaro government attempts to privatize the state oil company Petrobras. Brian Meyer brings us more details in the following report. Today marks day 12 of the largest petroleum workers strike that's taken place in Brazil in over 25 years. All across the country, over 108 different centers of Petrobras State Petroleum comp Company, including offshore oil platforms, refineries, distribution terminals, fertilizer plants, have all shut their doors as strikers and picketers have shut down the area in front of the plants and refused to go into work. There are over 20,000 people on strike. Petrobras headquarters has an office that's been taken over by a group of union negotiators who are refusing to leave. There have been protests in front of the big media companies demanding that they give coverage to the strike, which they've been ignoring. Now, this is just another step in the battle against the systematic dismantling of Petrobras, the state petroleum company that's taken place since the 2016 parliamentary coup. Dilma Rousseff in 2014 issued a decree saying 100% of the profits from Petrobras would go towards public education and public health. That was immediately removed when coup president Michel Temer took over. And as the Bolsonaro government advances with its deep austerity cuts, they're systematically selling off the oil reserves and dismantling Brazil's capacity to be self-sufficient in energy. And this is one of the reasons the strike's going on, but it's also happening because they've announced a thousand layoffs in Paraná, a fertilizer plant, and the company is trying to negotiate illegally, unilaterally with different workers groups instead of with the union as a whole. So as the strike continues, the pressure builds on the media and on the government to give in to the union demands. And if this happens, it'll be one of the first major victories for unions since the labor reform laws were passed in 2017, which basically transformed Brazil into a right-to-work nation. Pope Francis received former president of Brazil, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, at the, at the Vatican. The two leaders are set to discuss the fight against hunger and inequality. The meeting between the Argentinian Pope and the Brazilian politician was due to be held this afternoon and expected to take place at Pope's residence. The meeting was facilitated by Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez, who visited the Vatican on January 31st. Health organization officials explained that adapting the case definition of the COVID-19 virus will widen the net and generate more confirmed cases as China's new counting methods, methods caused a dramatic spike in the official death toll. As reported on Thursday by the National Health Commission, the death toll has now risen to 1,367, while almost 60,000 people are infected. First of all, what is important to understand, it's normal during the course of an outbreak to adapt the case definition because we need to be very close to the reality to monitor the disease, uh, how it is unfolding. And this is what they have done recently, changing the case definition to incorporate mild cases that were not in the initial case definition, but also integrate the cases that are post-symptomatic or with limited symptoms because they were testing contacts around the cases. Japan's health ministry reported the country's first confirmed coronavirus fatality. The victim was a woman in her 80s. Her infection was known after her death. Japan has confirmed 247 cases of the virus. Meanwhile, Tokyo Olympic organizers stressed Thursday they are not considering canceling the Games due to the coronavirus outbreak. With just 162 days to go until the opening ceremony, concerns have been raised about the spread of the virus in, in Asia. But Tokyo 2020 CEO Yoshiro Mori rejected such concerns. Then, of course, we have uh, <coughs> unexpected uh, issues to deal with and for example the coronavirus outbreak is one event and um, we're looking forward to um, hearing today from uh, the Japanese government, the TMG um, and your own organisation 
on the uh, work that you're doing in collaboration with the World Health Organization um, and um, to ensure that um, uh, all of the athletes and all of the people who come to Japan for the games um, are not going to be affected and um, uh, that uh, all of the necessary precautions are being taken. More than 10,000 people in villages near Vietnam's capital were placed under quarantine on Thursday after the discovery of six coronavirus cases. In the first mass quarantine outside of China since the virus emerged, the Son Loi forming region, about 40 kilometers from Hanoi, will be locked down for 20 days, the Vietnamese health ministry announced. Health officials wearing protective suits sprayed disinfectant on vehicles and police warned that nobody was permitted to enter or leave the quarantined area. A U.S. cruise ship's block from several Asian ports over concerns that a passenger could have been infected with the new coronavirus finally docked in Cambodia on Thursday as frustrated holidaymakers expressed hopes their ordeal may soon be over. The MS Westerdam ship was supposed to be taking its 1,455 passengers on a dream 14-day cruise around the East Asia beginning in Hong Kong on February 1st and disembarking on Saturday in Yokohama, Japan. Cruise operator Holland America has insisted there are no cases of the virus on board and Cambodia announced Wednesday that the boat could be able to dock on its southern coast. We are taking one last break, but stay with us for more on the disruptions during South African President Cyril Ramaphosa's 2020 State of the Nation Address. Members of the Economic Freedom Fighters Party disrupted President Cyril Ramaphosa's State of the Nation address before the South African Parliament. For more than an hour, EFF legislators took turns asking for the floor in a bid to delay the beginning of the address in which the President took stock of events in 2019 and announced projects for 2020. The EFF legislators requested that former South African President Frederick William de Klerk leave the National Assembly before the address, claiming he was a murderer and had blood on his hands. The session resumed 90 minutes after its planned start with apologies from parliamentarians of several parties to the president for the disorderly behavior of the EFF representatives. The Libyan National Army denied blocking United Nations planes from landing in the country. The United Nations mission to Libya in a statement issued on Wednesday morning expressed regret that its regular flights did not obtain permission to land. It added that the incident was repeated on several occasions over the past few weeks. On Wednesday, the UN Security Council endorsed the 55-point roadmap to end the war in Libya. We do not give permission to land at a base controlled by a colonizer, as this may cause any operation against this aircraft or against these individuals, and thus we will be accused for it. You can use Misrata Airport. It is open for civil and private flights. The World Health Organization has extended its global emergency designation for the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Our correspondent, Oscar Epelde, brings us more details. The World Health Organization and its committee of experts decided yesterday in Geneva to renew the declaration of international health emergency for the Ebola outbreak in North Kivu and in Ituri. The new confirmed cases of Ebola are becoming increasingly rare. Last week there were only three new cases, but the theoretical risk makes it necessary to continue considering it as an international emergency. That's what the WHO chief Tedros Adhanom has said. It would be time to consider as an urgency the strengthening of the national health system as part of the rationale of the allowance of funds for the fight against the Ebola outbreaks in the DRC.
At the same time, security remains critical both in the great north of Kivu and in Ituri, where arms continue to kill and displace civilians despite military advances against the IDF. The small-scale massacres continue to occur, killing peasants, but also blocking out the democratic evolution of social institutions. Injured and sick Yemeni children are receiving treatment in a Jordanian hospital following the devastating war back home. They arrived in Amman on a flight from Sana Airport organized by the World Health Organization and carrying 24 patients, including children. The move comes in response to the state of the health system in a country rocked by a war the UN says has caused the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Houthi rebels have controlled Sana'a since 2014 when they seized much of the country's north from the government of President Adebrado Mansur Hadi. The war escalated when a Saudi-led military coalition intervened on Hadi's side the following year. Since then, the conflict has left tens of thousands of Yemenis dead or wounded, including many civilians. Hundreds of Iraqi women of all ages flooded central Baghdad on Thursday alongside male anti-government protesters defying an order by powerful cleric Moqtada Saad to separate different genders in the rallies. Some of the women were veiled, others not, while most wrapped their faces in black and white checkered scarves. The majority carried roses, Iraqi flags or signs defending their role in the demonstrations demanding political change in the country. They marched through a t tunnel and spilled out into Tahrir Square, the epicenter of the youth-dominated movement in a country where vast regions remain socially conservative. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities announced the discovery of 16, 16 ancient tombs with about 20 sarcophagies and thousands of funerary objects at a necropolis in Upper Egypt, Egypt's province of Minja. The tombs and unearthed objects belong to the late period starting from the 26th dynasty that ruled ancient Egypt some 26 2,600 years ago. The archaeological mission of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, led by its Secretary General Mustafa Wasiri, started excavation at Al Guraifa in November 2017 when it announced the discovery of several tombs with hundreds of statues, and the excavations are still ongoing. And we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And please join on on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Cristina Escobar. Thank you for watching.